going to be looking at this, this example where we let go of the last time. There's the interaction in this example that gives an interest to us. But uh, my focus for today's class is to show you how you can calculate the model coefficients in R, how you can use R to build the model. But then the more important thing we do going forward is how you actually use the model and apply it. And then after that example, we'll continue on with a uh, UK study and a categorical variable in here. So we're going to start to build up all the skills that you need for your course project here. Essentially how to build the model, how to use the model, and how to deal with the categorical variable. Those are our goals today. And let's take our last example later on up there on the slide. So you don't need to find it down, but I'll just go to use the two plot, which is where you should always start for any problem is by drawing the data on the two plot. So when we ran this experiment, we ran it with low temperature and high substrate, and low temperature, high temperature, low substrate, and high substrate. The yield of 77, 79, 81, and 89. So those were the data from last time. And as I said, they're out there as well. And to be clear, when we say we run this at low temperature and high temperature, that low and high refer to definitive values. When your operator goes and runs this experiment, or the registry unit, you would tell them run at 390, 400 Kelvin corresponds to low and high state. Same for substrate, half a gram per meter or one point two five gram per meter corresponds to real world units. And last class we showed yesterday how we convert from real world units to minus ones and plus ones. Those minus ones and plus ones have some utility for us in our statistical model, which is why we use them. And the conversion between real world units and coded units the goal was to say, take your real world data and subtract from it with the center point. So I sometimes just refer to this as CP, the center point and divide through by half the range. Okay, so that's how you link your real world units over to your coded units. It's an important formula to use. We're going to use them in reverse in the future. But to, in today's class, we want to know how to take our real world units and take them over to coded units. And what we showed last time is that these quarter points correspond to minus one and plus one, minus one and plus one in the real axis. So, so it's, a, it's a, a nice, even and balanced span. And what I've asked you to do is to go take those, those four data points, and I've asked you last time to go prove to yourself that you can derive that least squares model. We showed last time how to do it with a different example. With this data set, the result is given to you over there. You can prove this to yourself by calculating x transpose x inverse x transpose y. So you should be able to do that very comfortably by hand if you didn't do so already yesterday and you practiced it. I strongly recommend you do that because of the course of an exam or even in a real plant environment where you don't have access to a computer, you can do this in two, three minutes on a piece of paper and quickly build the least squares model. It's probably the only time you can actually derive the least squares model by hand and do it correctly. So what I'd like to do and propose uh, to ask you is let's put this model up here. I'm going to ask you to use this model. Now, you're going to show yourself how you can apply it to a, a new situation. So let's just write it up here. 81 and a half units, that's my set, remember. Two and a half units of xt, as xt refers to the temperature in coded units, plus three and a half units times xs, that's the substrate co um, coefficient is three and a half. And then the one and a half refers to the temperature substrate interaction. And the fact numerically that one and a half is big 
similar in magnitude to the two and a half and the three and a half, inter indicates that that interaction is important. If the interaction is small or non-existent, that term would be essentially zero, including the problem with it. Okay, so go ahead, please, and predict what the yield is going to be from the system if your operator runs at a temperature of 405 Kelvin and substrate concentration of one and a half grams per meter. Okay, go for it. Work with the person next to you. Calculate the predicted yield at those new conditions.
395 Kelvin, 187 several times, and 1875 grams per liter. So at the center over there, you're at 395 Kelvin, and you're a little bit going between 0.5 and 1.25. Okay, so you're at, one, at 1 875. So if we're asking where we're going to be at 405 Kelvin, one half grams per liter, roughly where on that cube plot are we located?
predicted value of 81 and a half. We get a contribution of two and a half times two, in other words, a five unit increase in yield simply due to temperature. This first, this term over here corresponds to the effect of two and a half times xt. Here's what this two and a half times two is telling me. That's the boost due to temperature, an additional five unit boost. The xs effect, the substrate effect, is three and a half times xs. So 3.5 times 1.67. So we get an additional 5.83 boost from substrate. And then the interaction buys us an additional boost of 1.5 times 2 times 1.67. So this interaction term over there, it's significant. It adds a significant improvement in the yield, in this case, in the order of 4.83. So if you sum up those three contributions, you get a predicted Y of 97%. And that makes sense. We expected a number up here in the high 90s.
Okay, so at this point, I, I will also show you how you can have, you could have done what we just did here in R. So in R, when you start to acquire the data for your experiments, you will go and resort to R to help build the models. You should also, of course, for simple models, build this by hand. But I'd like to show you how you could have done this in R. So in R, you go create a least squares model with the T column, and I already used coded variables, so T then is a vector of minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one. Um, yeah. S then is a vector of minus, minus, plus, plus. So paste that in, and then paste your Y variable, which you can stand for. It's 77, 79, 81, 89. It's in the standard order. Standard order is really important to us. So we can just literally write it like that and you know what to do. And then you go create a linear model of R, say, call it M O E. There's a linear model where Y is described by, and then there's three terms here. T plus S plus the T times S interaction. So Y is T plus S plus T times S. And R, remember, will automatically add an intercept in more for you so that is there. So run that, and then the summary of that model looks as follows. Let's take a look at that. Let's decode what it says there for a minute. So I repeat back to us what our formula was. It says all four residuals are moved to zero. No residual degrees of freedom. So what is the degrees of freedom? Remember, for a least squares model, in general, any type of least squares model, the degrees of freedom from the ANOVA table we call was equal to n minus k. Remember that formula from a few weeks ago? Well, n is your number of data points, which is 4. k is your number of parameters that you've estimated. We've estimated a v0, a vt, vs, and vts. So 4 parameters, 4 minus 4. Zero. That's why we have no degrees of freedom. And that's also why you see all of these terms are in A. The moment you have no degrees of freedom, you can't go calculate standard error. Remember, standard error's formula was to take a residual sum of squares divided by n minus k. Well, n minus k is zero, dividing by zero is undefined, so there is no standard error. It's now, not a number. And we can't go calculate any standard errors. I cannot help it. Confidence in your all of that disappears. What we've done here is done the equivalent of when you fit a straight line through two data points. There's one unique way of fitting a straight line through two data points. Here we fit four parameters with four data points, the same principle. But notice there that the slope coefficients and the intercept correspond exactly to what we have up here on the board. You can prove this equation by hand.
you may have a system where you want to minimize something rather than maximize it. You can also use experiments to do that. So, as I said, the first rule whenever you're faced with an experimental data set is let's draw the Q part. And I'll show you how we can do that for three dimensions. So here are three variables. Notice that this table is in standard order. The first variable is your compound, chemical compound, and you're using the compound A versus B. So it's a categorical variable. We assign the low value of that to A and a high value to B. So whether the compound uses polymer A or polymer B to treat their water. A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. Low, high, low, high, low, high, low, high. So notice that the first variable changes the most rapidly. The second variable is the temperature at which they treat the waste water. It's 72 Fahrenheit or 100 Fahrenheit. Notice here, low, low, high, high. So it moves fast, but not as fast as the first column. It moves at half the rate of the first column. Low, low, high, high, low, low, high, high. And the last variable is the speed of agitation. Four lows, four highs. So that's standard order for three variables. So we'll always have that happen. So what these companies have well done is they've used, run these eight experiments, they ran them in a different order. There's the actual order in which they ran the experiments. Never, ever run your experiments in standard order. We present our table in standard order, but we never do our experiments with this row first, then the next row, then the third row. Never do that. It's the worst possible way to run your experiments. Standard order is used because it's a great analysis tool, but it's never used to run the order of your experiments. That's, that's important. Well, how do we visualize data that comes from three variables? As follows, we draw a Q plot, and our first variable is C. So I'm going to draw this pretty big so that we can all see it. And factor C. <coughs> over here. And factor C being a categorical variable corresponds to using chemical A at the low level and using chemical B at the high level. The second factor is temperature. Temperature was either, either 72 Fahrenheit or 100 Fahrenheit. Okay, and then the third variable we represent in and out of the board. That's the stirrer speed effect. And we draw our Q plot. Let's place our numbers on that Q plot. The first experiment, we achieved a waste discharge value of five units. So that corner point is five. The next experiment, the standard order, corresponds to using chemical B at low temperature and at low stirrer speed. So stirrer speed is the, the variable in and out of the board here. This is my stir speed direction, S. And the front face corresponds to 200 RPM, and the back face corresponds to 400 RPM. Okay, so that experiment there yielded the Y value of 30 units. The next experiment was run with compound A at 100 Fahrenheit, also at low stir speed. So all of the first four data points are on the front face. And that got a discharge chemical value of six pounds discharged. The next experiment was with the compound B. And that discharged 33 units. Okay, then the, the back face corresponds to four, three, five, four in that order. So four, three, five, four, the same pattern. example of why BMEs are so intuitive and powerful. Take a look simply at that drawing and tell me which combination of C, T, and S you would use in the future. So 
only we have to look at the table just at the visualization. Which combination of CT and S we can use in the future? Okay, let's go in order. Compound A or compound B? Someone in the company looked at the system and considered 
72 to 100 to be the typical range of operation. We've just proven that over the range of typical operation temperature is not okay. That's good enough for the conclusion of the conclusion. So over this range, temperature doesn't have effect. Absolutely, if you went to 200 M, temperature like it will start to matter. Can you say the same thing about the uh, rotation of steering speed? It's, it's only B that really has the high ones. If you look at the A, it doesn't really decrease that much. Yeah, there's, yeah that's what Jenna was saying. Oh. If you look at stirrer speed, that's, that's right. If you selected A, then stirrer speed does not matter anymore. There's actually a cancellation happening here. Once you go to A, it cancels out the effect of stirrer speed. That will show up as the interaction. Okay, so we've got this data set. Let's, yes? Quick, um, when, when we selected A, you had mentioned that A is more robust. Did you just explain what you said? A is more robust because all the four data points on the A face, on this left face over here, are low. If I'm at the B face, I've got two high points and two low points. Robust, I, I guess I would take to mean here that it's insensitive to operators screwing up. Right? So if, once you've chosen chemical A, if someone comes along and increases the temperature, nothing's going to change. And if they go and increase or decrease the stirrer speed, nothing's going to change. If you had chosen compound B, you can get away with high stirrer speed. But if someone goes and turns that stirrer speed low, you're going to start to see high discharge. Okay? So that's not robust. It's not robust to people making mistakes. Because compound A keeps you away from it. Okay, so we've, we've said that compound A, high S, and temperature doesn't matter. So when we build the least squares model for this, we should see that same result. Now I'm not going to do the, the least squares model by hand. That's your job to go do practice. I've practiced enough times in my life on this example. I'm going to show you how to do it in R. So we quickly do that in R together. It's quite straightforward. There's a little bit of interesting code here for it though that you may not have seen before. So in R you'd say the following. It's a little bit of a strange statement to make here. But you say C is equal to T, which is equal to S, which is equal to a vector of minus 1 plus. So all I'm doing is I'm creating three variables in one row in one line. It's just a shortcut. You can verify that C, T, and S then are all the same two variables. And then the next line, what I do is I use this little shortcut in R to create my standard for the table. Obviously, if you use the copy and paste this code, you're using your own examples in the future. So we use the expand.grid function. What expand.grid does is it expands those minus ones and plus ones into the standard for the table that we just used. C is minus plus minus plus minus plus plus minus minus plus plus and so forth. Okay, so it just saves you from typing and making mistakes. Use the expand of the function. This code is all posted on the course page. You don't, don't need to copy it out. So what we'll do is we now pull that column from the matrix as my C column, as my Z column, and my X column. And so those next three lines do to create shortcut variables C, T, and S. So C, T, and S are those standard order columns. The only thing that you do have to type in by hand is your Y vector. You have to do that by, uh, by following the standard order. And just be careful of making mistakes here. So we use our standard order 5, 13, 6, 33, 4, 3, 5, 4. Standard order. The next line tells R to build the model. Now, you might be tempted to just use that code that I've got highlighted over there. Let's take a look at it. I'll paste it down here as well, a bit of contrast. It says, build a model where Y is described by C plus T plus S, plus a CT interaction, plus a CS interaction, plus an ST interaction, plus a CTS three-factor interaction. Why so many parameters in the model? Remember, eight experiments. N is equal to eight. We can fit eight coefficients. There's an intercept, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight slopes. So 
eight data points, eight coefficients. You can always do this for this crazy model from a DOE textbook. So eight experiments fit eight parameters. And if we look at model.pull, you'll see an example of what we did earlier. Take a look at that in a minute. But a far more efficient way of achieving the same goal is to actually use this code up here, where you tell our local <coughs> model where y is described by open brackets, c plus t plus s raised to the power of 3. And what that does is it finds all possible combinations of c, t, and s for you. So you don't have to think what that should be. It will automatically expand the amount to the third of the power. Um, so for our y, it's interesting to tell us if we're going to run for each experiment once. If we have the ability to say we're going to run for each three times, so you have some sort of reverse, but is there a way to do that in the formal model? Right, so if you make those c columns, t columns, and s columns multiple, I'll show you an example of that in the next slide. So let's go build this model over here and summarize it. So summary mod equal. And then we see the same thing as before. We've got zero degrees of freedom. Our R squared is one. And there's our slope coefficients for the system. Let's go take a look at what that says. If we had to write that out, it says y is equal to 11.25. And let's take a look at the effect of c. Plus 6.25 times xc. xc is the effect of c, run at low c or high c. Okay. So this 6.25 tells you what the effect of choosing chemical A versus chemical B is. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. I'll just leave it there for now. The T effect is plus 0.75 XT. So the effect of temperature then is <coughs> to increase y by 0.75 units for one unit change in XT. The S effect is minus 7.25 XS. It's telling you you'll see a 7.25 unit y for one unit increase in S. Um, so for example, let's say right now I'm going to do and you guys should know that C doesn't want to do it. Can you maybe change the class to two variables on here? C doesn't want to do it. Yeah, we're going to see that in a second. So let's take a look just at these two main effects. The S effect and the C effect. These are really important to understand. What makes it problematic for people the first time is the fact that we're using coded variables. So let's take the easier one of the two, the 7.25 XS. This says, as I increase XS by one unit, I will see a 7.25 decrease in Y. So remember, this coding corresponds to the fact that 200 RPM gets mapped over to minus one, and the 400 RPM is mapped to plus one. So in other words, there's a two unit span between 200 RPM and 400 RPM. There's a two unit coded span. So this tells me that a 100 RPM increase corresponds to a decrease <coughs> in the yield or the Y of the 17 Or in other words, if I went from the load from the front face to the back face as a two unit change, I would see a minus 14 and a half decrease on average due to excess. The categorical variable takes a little bit of extra work to interpret. The categorical variable refers here has got a coefficient of 6.25. That's for a one unit change in XC. Xc, though, is a categorical variable here at the front, and it doesn't really make sense to talk about a one unit change in a categorical variable. So what that tells you, the way we should interpret this, is 
remember we've had the compound A to minus one, and we've had compound B to plus one. There's a two unit change on the numerical scale between compound A and B. So in fact, the 6.25 means that going from compound A to compound B increases Y by 12.5. only time that our coding actually doesn't work really well with this. Is that with categorical variables, whatever this number is over here, its true effect in reality is double that value. So the switching from compound A to compound B means you'll see an increase in Y of 12.5 minutes. Everyone feel that? Yes. What value of xc do you use when you're using compound A? Minus 1. Okay. So there we can see that by using compound A, y will decrease by 6.25 units. Because it will be minus times plus 2. If we used plus 1 for xc to represent compound B, that shows we boost y by 6.25 units. So then the difference when going from A to B is double. Notice also that xt's coefficient is 0.75. Relative to the other two, that's a pretty small number, telling you right away that their temperature has little effect on y. So you can pretty much ignore temperature. The final one that presents itself as large is the cs coefficient. Let's take a look at that and we'll ignore the other small ones. So cs says minus 6.75 CS tells you to multiply XC by XX. That's our interaction. So what do we use then if we're operating, as we said, at high S, so high S, and with compound A, what values do I use? So I've got to sum in values here and say minus 6.75 Minus one or plus one for compound A. Minus one. And we said we should operate at high S plus one. So if I do that, what's what's that effect on Y? What is it that we want to do to Y? We want to decrease it. So this is a perfect example of an interaction that works against us. This interaction, normally our interactions work with us. They promote the behavior we're looking for. This interaction, unfortunately, goes and undo, goes and undoes some of the previous action. <coughs> so in fact, this boosts y by 6.75 units, unfortunately. It's still, however, the best combination. You can go prove it to yourself, I'll leave it to you to go try out. But say you decided, well, you know what, I want to go use high X, I'm uh, sorry, low X. Okay, so low S is going to change this from a plus one to a minus one. Okay, so then you're actually now going to decrease by 6.75 units. But when you've chosen to use low S with minus one, What's going to happen up here? This turns to a plus. Okay. So with this system, you cannot win. Okay. So that's what I want you to see. If you don't quite understand that, go play around with the numbers over the week and the 